Church, I want to I wanna jump right into the word um, that God has for us this morning. And uh, if you are a regular part of our church, you know that we are in a sermon series in the gospel according to Matthew. And today is part 42 uh, in the gospel according to Matthew. And guess what? We're only in chapter number 12. Uh, we have a lot more to go and a lot more to study. Next Sunday, we'll in fact take a break from the Gospel According to Matthew because it's conference week and uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, if we have, uh, if you have signed up for conference, you get to come in and experience what God is doing. I, I just heard, I didn't hear anything back, but there were a couple of cancellations that we got this week. I think two or three seats that came available. So if you're still interested in attending conference, let us know. Come meet us after service or uh, we'll, we'll provide you with a link that you can sign up for it. Please come and meet us. Let us know. But um, Chad Benson will be speaking on Sunday, and he'll be speaking at both our services. And uh, Sunday is also a landmark uh, day for us because we get to celebrate our sixth birthday as a church. Amen. Uh, yeah, there, there you go. Put your hands together. Woohoo! Um, six years ago, we planted in October, in October, October 28th, in an elementary school in Richardson. And God has just been so faithful to us. And what God has done has been just nothing short of amazing. And over the last few months, we've seen so much growth that's happened in the church, and we're excited for what God is doing in our midst. And you don't want to miss next Sunday. Uh, he's going to be at both our services. We have a 9 o'clock, 11. It's going to be a powerful time of worship, and uh, we're going to have some treats. We're going to cut a cake, all of that stuff after service, so you don't want to miss that. Uh, we're going to have that out in the lobby. Uh, it's going to be a great time. And we'll take a break from Matthew 12 next week, or the gospel going to Matthew, and then we'll pick it up in Matthew chapter number um, 13 when we come back to weeks uh, from now. But we are concluding Matthew chapter 12. Uh, I had Matthew 12 verses 46 to 50 as a part of my sermon last Sunday, but, uh, you know, as, as it happens very often, uh, you know, it just, I shoot over time and, and I have to push it over to the next week. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to finish off the message that uh, we started last uh, Sunday. Uh, just as a small recap, Jesus is addressing the adulterous heart's of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Uh, Jesus has just finished healing a man that has been set free or he was demon possessed and God sets him free from all the, the atrocities that he has been walking through and going through personally. We talked about spiritual warfare and the power of spiritual warfare and how God has given us authority over spiritual warfare. And as God is Jesus is having these conversations with the teachers of the law, the teachers are saying, Jesus, we'll believe in you. All you got to do is give us another sign. And Jesus looks at them and says, man, you guys are like a cheating husband or a cheating wife. No matter how much we please you, no matter how much I'm faithful to you, you are adulterous. You, no matter how many signs I show you, no matter how many miracles I show you, no matter how much I tell you that I am the Savior, I am the Messiah, you still keep coming back and you still, keeping, you still want to be amazed. You want to see a sign and it doesn't change who you are and it doesn't change your heart. So he says, your hearts are evil. This is the discussion we had last week. And he says, there's no more signs that I'm going to give you. There's only going to be one sign. And the sign that is going to come is that of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, all of this context is Matthew 12. You can go read it. Uh, you know, we, we, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and we study the word in its entirety. And Jesus has told him that, and then he digresses and he comes back to the subject at hand because he was talking about the demon-possessed man. And he comes back to that and he says, guys, take, de like, take spiritual warfare seriously. When you are gatekeepers of your heart and when you allow your heart to be exposed to spiritual warfare, there are things that come in through your mind, through your heart, that if you allow to take residence, it can completely destroy your lives. So we ended our conversation last Sunday by saying that you and I have a job. The job is to be gatekeepers and priests over our home, priests over our marriage, gatekeepers over our families, gatekeepers over our kids. We have that responsibility. And out of nowhere, Jesus is still sitting in that same house and Jesus is about to be interrupted in his teaching. 
Two weeks from now, we're going to start studying the parables of Jesus, where Jesus starts using al allegorical stories and uh, stories that he will, he will kind of put together and piece together to show people the kingdom dynamics or how the kingdom of God works. But before that happens, there is a royal family interruption that happens to this dialogue that is going on. So in Matthew chapter number 12, verse 46, we're introduced to this passage. If you have your Bibles with you, now would be a good time to turn to it. Or if you have your Bibles on your phones or whatnot, turn to it. And if you don't have either, the, the verses are on the screen. The Bible says, as Jesus was speaking to the crowd, guess who shows up? His mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and he said, look, these are my brother and my bro these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I, I, I kind of want to get into this. And as much as this is a passage that we could just read right through, this is a moment for us to pause and understand the heart of Jesus. What we're going to learn today is Jesus is about to open up this whole new world. This idea of becoming the family of God. What does that term mean? What is the term that, that says family of God? What does that even mean? What is that, what is that meant to mean in our lives? Jesus says, who is my family? You're saying that my family is here. He's not looking for an answer. It was a rhetorical question because this is Jesus. Duh, it is God. He is all knowing. He is all powerful. He knows everything. And it's not a question that was meant to demand an answer, rather to stir in their minds this idea of who are we? What are we meant to be? Who are we in relationship with Jesus and in relationship with God? Jesus is about to cause a rupture in the culture of that day, so to speak. There's this distraction that happens. There are a lot of distractions that has happened in, in Jesus' ministry, be it the woman that stops him on his way to another miracle, or if it was these friends lowering their, their friend that they cared about through the roof where Jesus was standing, and this guy almost falls. There were royal interruptions that has happened throughout Jesus' ministry, and this was yet another distraction. His mother this time and his brothers were standing outside the house because it was so, the people were thronging in the house. It was, they were not able to get in that they were truly concerned about Jesus. And Jesus was about to take and use a distraction as a teaching moment to make a distinction between his biological family and his spiritual family. Why? Why was this important? Because it was a room full of unbelievers. It was a room full of some people that believed, some people that had front row that were disciples, other people that professed to believe. They were teachers of the law and they knew the law, but yet their hearts were hardened to Jesus. There were skeptics in the room. There was own family that was standing outside of the room that really doubted him. And in many ways, his family is outside the room physically, but they're also outside the room spiritually. They're also outside the room in a very spiritual sense of the word. What are you talking about, Pastor Ashish? We need context over here. So let's go to Mark's account of this writing. In his, in his gospel, chapter number three, we get some clarity on what's going on over here. All right, so in verse number 20, the Bible says this, same story. Jesus entered a house and again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. Come on, somebody. 
Verse 22. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. This, is, this goes back to Matthew's original writing. And he says, he is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. And we know that story. We're not going down there. Verse 31. I'm, I'm fast forwarding. The Bible says this. And Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. The first part was they heard that Jesus was not eating. And just like any other mama who's going to be concerned that his son, her son or her daughter is not eating, right? He's, she's about to answer the call. And he says, come on, roped up the brothers uh, in unison and says, we are going to have, have an intervention with Jesus in this moment. So Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone to call, to call him. The crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And he says, who are my brother? Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. They looked and uh, he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, these are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does, the, whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. I want to pull you into this conversation because what this shows me is a family. But not just a family. In a few moments, I'm going to make you understand this was just not just another family, although it was a family of Jesus. We're going to study about a very dysfunctional family. This is probably part of a story of Jesus that you probably never heard before. Or it's probably a story that you have heard. But I want to remind everybody that family, by its pure definition, we are people, we are individuals, we are sinners, and that makes us people that don't have perfect families all the time. And Jesus' family was a good example of that. Jesus had a dysfunctional family on earth. Why? Because sin makes us dysfunctional. Plain and simple. But what Jesus is attempting to do in this conversation, and then what Paul will attempt to do in Romans chapter number three and in Galatians, is then to open the church's eyes into understanding what an adopted family looks like. He wants us to understand that although we may not be born into the family of Jesus, or we may not be Jews by birth, we may not have the DNA of that salvation experience of being God's own people, God in his infinite mercy and through this message of Jesus and then Paul is going to tell us that through adoption, we are true heirs of what Jesus has in store for you and for me. It was a few weeks ago that a few of us from this church, we were a part of uh, a, a, a dinner that one of our ministry partners was having, a banquet, a yearly banquet that they have where they celebrate their ministry wins. And uh, it's a ministry called Family First, which is focused very much on uh, adoption or equipping Christian families to adopt and foster or foster to adopt. They also minister to, uh, to, to young people that just turned 18, that phased out of the foster care system they give them a safe haven to ease them out of the foster care system, equip them, give them training, so on and so forth. In my conversations with one of the leaders, he was telling me something that just stood out to me so beautifully. He said, Ashish, do you know that when a boy or a girl is adopted into a family in Texas, the, that son or that daughter will have the same rights of heir as a as a child that is born by birth into that family. The same level, come on, of sonship, or they have the same level, so they cannot fall out of a will because they are an adopted child. Does that make sense? He said they have the same standing. It doesn't matter if they look like them, or they talk like them, or they're the same color as them. Irrespective of all of that, if you are adopted, you are under the will of the family that you're adopted in. Mm. And this struck something inside of me that, that just reignited this, 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 this message that I was preparing all week. And it just showed me that, man, it doesn't matter our origin or who we were or what the definition is of people that have to be people of God. Even though we are alien and we are Gentiles, like Paul says, we might not be born into the lineage of Christ, but by adoption, God, in his infinite mercy, infinite mercy, has given you and me the ability to be called sons and daughters of the living God. And that's beautiful to me. You know, Jesus uses this opportunity to talk about his family after the only sign that will be given. 
And this is beautiful because, and, 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 and why is it beautiful? Because man, these, these same guys that came looking for Jesus, the ones that he called his brothers, were, were, these guys didn't believe in Jesus. Actually in John chapter seven and verse five, the Bible says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. He had a dysfunctional family that did not believe in him. And, and, and Jesus was not attempting for them to believe in him. But Jesus had just finished talking about the only sign you're going to get is a resurrection. And guess what? It would be right after the resurrection that these brothers of his that did not believe initially starts believing in Jesus as soon as they see the resurrected Christ. In Acts chapter one and verse 14, the Bible says, and they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the woman, uh, woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Guess what? The same guys that despised him. I, I get it, you know? Like, like imagine Jesus going up to his own brothers, uh, co-brothers, like, like, you know, and, and saying, guys, you know, I, I'm God, by the way. I, I, I know that, you know, we're brothers, but you, you got to give me the respect of God. I'm, I'm God around here. And I could imagine how that would have gone down in their family, right? All these boys arguing about who is God. Come on, am I talking to somebody? I understand, Jesus, you're the oldest, but that doesn't give you any right. So they didn't like him a lot, but guess what? James, the brother of Jesus, became the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem. James and Jude both becomes authors of different books in the Bible. And Jesus looks at these people and says, you're talking about those guys, are they my brothers? Who are my brothers? Are they my brothers? And he says, no, those guys might be my earthly brothers. That woman standing outside, I honor her. That might be my earthly mother. But man, just because she is my earthly mother, she has no special favor with me either then or now. She stands individually as somebody that's privileged by God, that stood by Jesus. Man, he, she bore, the, the, she, she, was a, she, she had that virgin birth experience. The Bible says the favor of God was upon her. And a lot of people take that word favor and, and skew it to mean what they want it to mean. But the Bible literally, when it says Mary was filled with favor, it meant that among all the women of Israel, she was the one chosen to bear this child. Nothing more, nothing less. And he says, just because you're my mom, it doesn't give you any right. It doesn't give you access to this room. To, to be one with me, you got to be my disciple. He says, who are my brothers? You might have grown up with me, but that doesn't give you any right. But he says this, the third part is for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and my mother. Those beloved ones who do the will of God. I'm here to purely remind somebody today, this is not a message that has deep revelation. It's not a message that you're gonna go back and you're gonna be like, wow, this is amazing. I've never heard that before. But I wanna remind every person in this room, if you are off Jesus or you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, I wanna remind you, admission into the family of God is not by blood. It's not by family relationships, the color of your skin, how much money you have or you don't, but only through those who will do the will of the Father through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that, man, families are, are really people in our essence. We are dysfunctional and toxic because of sin. But Christ gives us a new family. And I want to be sensitive because there are probably people sitting over here that did not have a good upbringing. You did not have a present father. You did not have a present mother. You were probably people that, 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 that did not experience what being a part of an earthly family looked like. Some of you probably sat there today while we were dedicating Liana and you were hoping and, 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 and just wishing in your heart that your family did that to you when you were a child. And I understand the, the various emotions that probably go through your mind and go through your head, but I wanna remind you, this is what the scripture is saying. Blood may be thicker than water, but obedience is thicker than blood. Thank you, Melvin. Jesus is talking about obedience here. He's talking about what's happening outside the room. That's blood. And I'm pretty sure that blood is thicker than obedience. And in every sense of the word, I should drop whatever I'm doing. Or they expect me to just drop whatever I'm doing and just say, yes, mom. Yes, dad. Yes, brother. Yes, sister. But Jesus says, yo, like, like my, your obedience confirms your true identity as God's son or God's, God's daughter. And he says, guess who is my family? These people sitting right here. 
all the ones in the front row. He's looking at Peter and Andrew and saying, do you know what happened to these guys? These guys were fishing. And I looked at them and said, leave your nets and follow me. And guess what they did? They abandoned everything and they followed me. You want to know who's my brother? They're my brothers. Come on, I'm not talking, this, this is what he's trying to get at. He's saying, these women and these men in this room that left everything. And I think sometimes in our culture, we can take this for granted. Like, like sometimes in the, American, in the American way of doing things, we're so like caught up in the luxuries of religious freedom sometimes and freedom of anything sometimes that we don't understand what persecution looks like. Do you know that there are men and women standing and sitting in this room right now on these pews that were, that, were, that were persecuted for their own faith? There were young, there are young women and men sitting in this room. I'm talking about 20 year olds and 30 year olds that are sitting in this room that were Hindus at one point in time and their parents said, we want nothing to do with you anymore. Parents who have rejected their children because they said yes to Jesus. Guess who Jesus is talking about? Those people. Those people that let everything go. And Jesus says, even if nobody is there with you, I am for you. I am your, I am your, I am your family is what Jesus says. And those who gave up everything to follow me, obedience, the family trait is obedience to the father, not skin color, not the color of your eye or your, 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 you know, your, your influence or your financial abilities. God's true people have the mark of obedience upon them. Obedience to the father. And I want to clarify something. This wasn't meant to downgrade his blood relatives. It was just meant as an upgrade for you and I who were not his blood relatives. Hmm. So Jesus is like, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who's my spiritual family? He says, these, these guys right here. He points to Peter and James and John and Matthew and Simon. Peter, the brash one. That's who he points to. Like, geez, you claim that dude? Yeah, that, that guy right there. With all his failings, with all his shortcomings, the guy that speaks too fast, that guy, the one that, that is brash in his talk, that guy, Jesus? Yeah, that, that's the Peter I'm talking about. I'm talking about James and John. He's talking about Judas. The betrayer, Jesus? Like, you're talking about the, he's gonna betray you. No, 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 he's my family. I just, just kind of go with me on this. Simon's my family. Matthew, the tax collector. That dude that used to exhort from us, he is your family. Yeah, that's my family. Because why? Because he says, those I identify with are the ones that follow me. Remember, Jesus looks at the room full of people. There is a room full of people, yet he looks at his disciples. And he says, look at this row of people. The ones that are here, that are present, that have abandoned everything. All of you in the room, look at them. They are my family. And he gives them the opportunity that are in the room to access that which these disciples have. And what he's allowing them to do is gain that access, giving them the inroads to respond to this beautiful cry and this invitation of Jesus and I want to remind you, if you have responded to this beautiful invitation that Jesus has, that says, come to me, those who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. That is the family of Jesus. All of you that don't have it together, come to me. I will give you rest. It's you who Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the Peters. He has, he's talking about the ones that don't have it together. And I'm asking us as a church community, who is your church family? Like, who is your spirit? Do you have a spiritual family? I need us to pause and I need us to think about this question because here's what, post-COVID, this is what stats show. Stats show that committed Christians come to a corporate gathering once every three weeks. I really want us to please take this to heart if you're a believer, if you are a Christian, please, I urge you, find a church to call your home. Find a church to take your kids to Sunday after Sunday. Keep them in church. Let them be trained in the admonition and the training of God Almighty. Hmm. 
We have to prioritize, prioritize spiritual family. And when we do prioritize our spiritual family, we got to make our spiritual family the priority in our lives and our schedules. I'm really coming down on this, church. Is that okay? Can I talk for a few minutes? The Christian life is not a life that you just live with your family and your kids. It is a life that you do in community. Corporate community is of importance. They broke bread together. It was a part of what the church was in the New Testament time. But guess what? Our lives get busy. Everyone's busy. I understand we're all busy. But guess what? Church, community, life group, Bible study is the first thing to go off the priority list when our schedules get busy. I don't know if you're there, but I'm there. What can I take off my busy list this week? Ah, it's just church. It's just serving. It's just ah, somebody else will, be, will do it. Somebody else. Will, it's okay. They'll, they, could, they could still do a life group without us, right? Like we're not it, right? We don't say anything in the group, life group anyway. We're just there for the food, you know? Just kidding, y'all. Just kidding. <laughs> like my real question is how many of us, if you call this your church family, and I really want to talk to people that say that this is your church family, how many of you can look across the room, look around the room, and truly say that you know somebody that's going through a financial crisis? that you truly know that somebody is going through a mental breakdown and they're at the end, they're their wit's end, that they're wanting to throw the towel in. How many of you know that there's a vet in this room that's probably going through PTSD? How many of you know that there's probably a couple that's going through a strained marriage that needs your help, that needs you to remind them that God is good and for you to remind them that you're praying for them and for them to know that they have community to lean on. There are people waiting in our church to be invited to a marriage group. There's a young adult that is going through so much stress at school and they want to give up, but there's not one person that knows that they're going through that. And guess what? Sometimes they're not going to tell us. And for many of us that don't have it really that bad, create another seat at your table for somebody to come and be a part of. Talk to someone that's new and, 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 and you're probably going to snap right back at me and say, but pastor, that's not me. That's not who I am. I get it. But can I also suggest that that's the biggest lie that the enemy wants you to believe? That that's not who you are, that you're meant to be lonely and not talk to anybody and be that lonesome person in the corner of the room that the enemy can attack all over again. That's the lie that he wants you to believe in. And then yet the others that stand aside and say, Pastor, no, I've, I've just been hurt way too many times by community. I've just been hurt, church hurt, Lord. I, everyone love, loves to use that phrase, church hurt a lot. Oh, Pastor, I've just, I've just been hurt by this pastor that used to, be, used to lead me, so I just don't trust pastors that much. So, Pastor, I'm just going to come and go. Don't, I won't bother you with my prayer needs. Or How's that working out for you? Sometimes being in community is painful. Sometimes we have to grow in patience with the people that God has put us in community with. Sometimes disappointments are a part of community. Please, I want to pull you into this conversation. You know, Jesus had community. Jesus takes his 12 disciples with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't know if you remember this moment. In his most painful moment in his life, he takes all 12. He takes his disciples and then he says, y'all stay here. I'm going to take my intimate community. He had three that he takes with him. Peter, James, and John. He says, come, let's go. And there was a reason behind it. He says, you guys are the prayer warriors, but remember your prayer warriors will sometimes disappoint you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to dig into this right now. Jesus says, these guys, I know that they will come through for me. There's a reason I'm leaving the others and picking these three to come with me. Guess what? They, Jesus says, guys, you know, I'm going to go through the hardest moment of my life. I am going to go through persecution. They're going to rip me apart, but I need you in this moment. They say, we got you, Jesus. We got you. And Jesus is sweating blood and tears and Gethsemane. And Jesus says, let me just go check on my brothers. And he's checking in on them. And guess what they're doing? They are knocked out, church. And guess what I would do at church? You were supposed to be my best friend. You were supposed to be my community. 
You were supposed to pray for me. You were supposed to guard me. You were supposed to do this, but yet you didn't live up to your words. Or it might be that betrayer. It might be that person that betrayed your trust. And guess what a lot of people do when that one time hurt happens? We walk away. You will go to the 12 and you'll say, let me look for a new three. Guess what many of us will do? We'll just abandon the 12 altogether. We'll say, I'm going to go look for a new church. I'm going to look for a new group of friends because one time is too many. But guess what Jesus does? Jesus comes back and says, guys, I understand that you're tired. I understand that this is not your crucial moment. I know it's not your hurtful moment, but I need you to be there for me right now. We're all human. We're, we will fail. We will forget. There are people that you will remind that you're going through a hard time. Guess what? They are going to disappoint you. They are going to forget you. But remember, that's not a sign that they don't care for you or God doesn't love you. We're just human. It's a moment that you just come back and reiterate. So Jesus says, guys, and he doesn't do it once. He doesn't do it two times. He does it three times. Why? Because he says, I need community right now. In your pain, don't regard disappointments. Don't regard people putting you down and and, and ignoring you as moments that you could give up. But God is reminding you that God loves you and he's put you in a certain community for a reason. It could be the church. It could be God moving you from another city to be here today, right now, in this season. I was talking to a family that was in tears after first service. They're like, Pastor, sometimes we don't understand why God moved us here to the city, but we know that today God confirmed to us that it's in his plan. And if God moved you, if God brought you, man, God can make you thrive in community, thrive in in, in places that you cannot see usually. But God says, man, you are my family and the family of God cares and loves. He says, this is my family. The one that slept, they're my family. The ones that are going to betray me, he is my family. The one that's going to disbelieve, Thomas, that's my family. The one that's going to disown me three times, Peter, that's my family. The one that's going to flee from me again, Peter, that's my family. Even these guys, I'm like, guess what, church? There's no perfect church. There's, you can try all you want. You can search the breadth and the length of the United States of America. You can move to Canada if you want but I promise you, you will not find a perfect church. We are a church filled with imperfect people and I'm proud of that. As a pastor, I am proud of that because we're not trying to build a perfect church. We are trying to be a place where we can invite imperfect people to come and meet a perfect Jesus. Worship team, you guys can come in. you know what Jesus is insinuating here? I'm, I apologize, guys. It just went over a few minutes because we had a couple of things that we had to do today. So just bear with me for five more minutes. Do you know what Jesus is, is insinuating? Pain is no reason to disregard your spiritual family. It's messy and it's hard and it'll require a level of forgiveness that you can't even imagine and fathom sometimes. But there's a reason you're in this spiritual family. You don't stop, you don't quit serving. You don't quit showing up. You don't quit going to Bible study or life group. You don't just stop calling your mentor. Like Jesus did that to us and he continues. He leaves heaven to walk with this broken people. Like Jesus loves us. He, you know, he, like we rejected him, we despised him, and yet he still calls us his family. You know, the design of Jesus was that we be in family. We be there for one another. Would you stand up to your feet with me all over this place? That was and that will always be the original design. You know, the gospel is filled, is filled with these messages of Jesus where he involves us in community. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, love one another. 
Jesus says, care for one another. Honor one another. Greet one another. I know that turning around to your neighbor and saying hi to them after worship is the hardest thing in your week. But I'm sparing you of another commandment that Jesus put in there said that the New Testament tells us to do is to give each other a what? A holy kiss. I'll spare you of that. But get out of our, our bubbles and, and say, you know what? Greet one another. What do you do with that? You acknowledge their existence. You have no idea the people that are walking into this church. You have no idea what circumstances they're walking in with, but you literally turning to them and greeting them is letting them know that they exist. The Bible says, welcome one another. It says, show hospitality to one another, fellowship with one another, live in harmony with one another, be at peace with one another, be kind to one another, forgive one another, bear one another's burdens, comfort one another, care for one another, encourage one another, build one another, pray for one another. Do I have to go on? Because there are almost 53 one another's in the New Testament. 53. And it wouldn't be there if Jesus wasn't, wasn't serious about being there for one another. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Who's my family? Yeah, I'm, trust me, it's not that I don't like Mary or I don't like James or Jude's all right, but I, I, I like them. They're, they're cool dudes. I, you know, I, I could kick with them, but, but that's not who I'm, I came to this earth for. I came to this earth for every other person in this room that gave everything up to be a part of a bigger family. You know what unites every person in this room? There, there are people from different ethnicities, different backgrounds. That's what we try to be as a church. We try to be a church for all people, all men, without prejudice, without restraint. We choose to love like Jesus does. But we can't do that without the help of every person in this room. Without every person automatically fighting the temptation of automatically just going to the same circle that you're a part of in the lobby Sunday after Sunday, but opening that circle up and saying, can I, do I have in, like the bandwidth to be able to invite another person to my table, to my conversation? Like who am I letting know that they belong to the family of Christ? Jesus loves you unconditionally. And I want to leave you with this word today. Because I believe in my heart that we are called to be a community of believers that builds community, that has genuine. When you hear the word authentic community, I just don't want it to be a phrase that's on the walls or on our website or just a loose term that we use. I want authentic community to be breathed into everything we do at church. What does that mean? Authentic community does not equate perfect community. It does not mean, or it's not, a, it's not synonymous with, with, <laughs> with perfect people. Authentic community means this is who we are, broken, not put together, but for His mercy, but for His glory, but for His grace. We're just going to spend a few moments in prayer and I just want us to take a few moments to just surrender ourselves. Give ourselves to the Lord today. We're going to have prayer available for those who want prayer. And part of fellowship is, part of being in community is allowing people to come into your needs. And if that's you, and if you need somebody to join with you in prayer, I'm going to ask some of our elders to come up and just be available for prayer. And if that's you, please come up. Seek prayer. Seek fellowship. Seek community. And the Holy Spirit has asked me to address some people in this room that have probably been hurt, like Jesus was hurt. You've been hurt, personally hurt. It could be a, a church, a pastor. It could be a, a community of believers that hurt you. It could be a leadership that hurt you. You've lost trust. You asked them to stay up and pray and they didn't. And you probably walked out on them and God's like, before you throw the towel in, be Jesus and give it another chance. If you have the opportunity to reconcile with a brother, reconcile with that brother. 
But if this is the new community that God has brought you, man, learn how to trust this new community. I want to say a word of prayer over you. And as we do every Sunday, the altar will be open. The worship team will be on stage. If you prefer to stand where you are and worship, do that. If you feel like you need to be dismissed after I give you the benediction, you're welcome to do that. If you feel like asking somebody near you to just pray over you, do that. If you feel like just bowing down or going to the side of a room and just being by yourself and just worshiping for some time, do that. But I really want some of us to take this message and ask yourselves, who is my spiritual family? Who knows me? Who do I know? Who am I accountable to? Who's accountable to me? Do I genuinely have an authentic community? Father, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this day. We surrender ourselves. We surrender our hearts. We give ourselves to you as we get ready, God, to be dismissed and go about our weeks. Father, I just pray for the power of God to be upon us and our church community, God. I pray for every person in this room. Empower them. Strengthen them. Give them what they need this week to live in perfect community. Our glory, our honor, our power, our praise be unto you and you alone. We thank you and we praise you. Church, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance your direction. May he give you peace that passeth all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.